What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up Podcast. Just wrapped up a series against the Braves that didn't necessarily go well. Ended it with a win on Sunday Night Baseball, which I, I guess was nice. That was a good way to end the series, at least. Better than what we saw from the first three games. As always, me and James are going to talk with you about what happened this series. Honestly, guys, going to be kind of a big narrative episode. We're going to just kind of more talk freely about what was going on, vibes, feels, conversations, rather than go game by game for this one, because... Honestly, the first three games don't really want to talk about them very much. I think we know what happened. We saw the scores. We saw the games. There's not much to talk about in those. So we'll just talk about what we're thinking about with the series and our thoughts and our feelings and all that good stuff. So make sure you guys are following us on all our social media at Mets Up on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribe to the New York Mets YouTube channel if you want to see a video version of this. You could get a live reaction of my face and James's face as we talk about this past weekend. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe. Seriously, guys, big shout out to you that are all hanging around listening and watching and still supporting all the stuff that we do over here. We know being a Mets fan is definitely a different ride than many other teams sometimes. And the fact that you guys still have an interest in listening to the team and listening about what's going on this season, really do appreciate it because we love doing this podcast for you guys. But before uh, before we get going into this deeper, James, how are we feeling over there? I mean, you know how I'm feeling. This was uh, a more difficult weekend than most to be a Mets fan. It was has been it's been a taxing couple of days. We also we 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 spent the whole day together yesterday with a bunch of friends hanging around Brooklyn, yeah. and we just happened to hang out with friends of friends who are all from the Atlanta, the greater Atlanta area, and just having people who don't care about baseball being like, "We beat y'all twenty one to three today." I was like, "Don't want to hear that." Yeah, yeah I, I wish I wish you didn't say that. Uh, it's, it's been OK Sunday, though. Like, it's just it's pain. It was it was a hard, hard weekend in Mets world. Yeah, I was uh, at the game with my parents. <laughs> the game won a doubleheader when we uh, we left early because it started pouring raining and it was 10 nothing at the time. Little did we know that was going to be half of the runs that were scored in that game. Just not not a pretty one, not a great one. And that was kind of just the vibe for the entire series. Like, I, I, I do get that they won game four uh, on Sunday Night Baseball. Kodai Senga on the mound pitched pretty well. We'll talk about him in a little bit. But the whole vibe of this series was very different, very not what I was hoping for when the season started. Like, even talking to my dad, because he got the 20-game pack this year, and he was like, I know I wasn't going to go to all these games this, week, this weekend. He's like, but I had three of these four Braves games on the 20-game pack, like, lined up ready to go. He was like, I was excited. Like this was going to supposed to be like the series of the year between the Mets and the Braves. And it was, I mean, for lack of a better term, a bit of a stinker. Yeah. I remember preseason. We had just made our infamous uh, A's nationals bet that I'm going to have to buy you a steak for because I'm losing yeah. by too many games. And we looked at the schedule. We're like, it'd be really funny now that every team plays every team. If we can go to the A's national series, like if they're tight, like that would just be like funny for us. We could probably make some good content out of it. And then we looked at the schedule. We were like, Oh no, that's the weekend. The Braves are in town. We can't do that. No. But <laughs> the series would have been a fine one, a fine one to miss because it really, it hurt. It really hurt deep. And you hear the way that the Braves players talk about playing the Mets. You hear, you saw the body language on a lot of our guys this weekend. You saw peak get really frustrated Saturday night. Just, go after helmet in the dugout and like understandably so like he, he's just a guy who just plays a lot of emotion it's just like it can't feel good just how how it keeps happening against this team and just how absolutely ablaze these atlanta braves are this is a very good atlanta braves team uh we were the, again mentioning the people we were hanging out with yesterday very casual baseball fans but they are one of the best teams in baseball and i know you have you know doubts of their starting pitching but still at the end of the day when you look at the three best teams in baseball. The Atlanta Braves are one of them, which sucks because I hate them and I hate that team and I've hated them forever since we're born. This team has been incredible. I don't. I think maybe J.J. Cooper of Baseball America put out a tweet that if you were born like 33 years ago, you would have seen the Braves win the division 21 out of the 33 years you're alive, which is like, I mean, something you dream of as a sports fan. And granted, they only have two World Series in that time, but man, I'd kill for two World Series right now. And you know what else? Like that even feels low. Just thinking about what the Braves have done in our lifetime, it feels like they've won this division basically every single year. They had what eighteen in a row at one point until yeah. I think the I think did we break until that six. Three kids for the, yeah, yeah, two thousand six. We broke that, and the Phillies got a few, and they just came right back. They had a couple of really bad years. They got in trouble for cheating, and then they have completely stormed through ever since, like nonstop. And you look at just the players in this organization. Like you look at guys like. Matt Olson, Austin Riley in the middle of the order. Those two guys, if you just take their numbers after the All-Star break, and this is a tweet from Jay Kuda, a pretty popular baseball Twitter guy, funny, funny guy. 
Austin Rad- uh, Matt Olson's 162 game pace since the All Star break is over 80 home runs, <laughs> and Austin Riley's is oh, it's over seven it's over 70 home runs and two about 200 RBIs a piece. Matt Olson is has a legit shot for 140 RBIs. He yeah. has a real shot for 60 home runs. I don't think people are talking about it enough because Ronald Acuna is going to have like a 30 50 season on the other side. Shohei Otani also has a shot for 60 home runs, but it's like he talked a lot about um an adjustment he made. I think it was pregame today in ESPN because Matt Olson has been a guy who's always had prodigious power. and always been a great defensive first baseman, really, really good baseball player. It's a criminal how little he was traded for. It's a real shame that no one else in major leagues can made we an offer to the Oakland athletics. Can we get MLB to step in like David Stearns did or David Stern did for, uh, for the NBA with the Chris Paul trade going to the Lakers. I mean, come on. The Braves have got Shaw, uh, Sean Murphy and Matt Olson. And am I forgetting somebody else? Whatever. They've got those guys for absolutely nothing. You look back at that trade. Manny Pino was a piece. That guy is a triple-A catcher who's like 35. I mean, come on. We got Can we get an investigation somewhere into this? The Matt Olson trade with Shea Langoliers, who's like an okay baseball player, Christian Pache, who's now in the Phillies, and Ryan Cusick and Joey Estes, who neither of them are probably <sighs> going to be major league players. And <sighs> yeah, I, I got sidetracked because it's so sad, but like I... And we and with the Mets fans, we know the fruits of trading with the A's. We got Chris Bassett for free. He was a key cog in yeah. the 101 win season last year. We got him for absolutely nothing. But Matt Olson talked about the change he made with two strikes to where he isn't necessarily concerned with his strikeout total anymore, but now he's just making a conscious effort to change his approach with two strikes. So he's basically like his entire at bat is trying to hit a home run, but then with two strikes, he's no longer trying to hit a home run, just trying to like do something with it. And that's really helped his batting so average, just- really helped him consistency. Something that was really cool that I noticed for the first time, like physically was with Zach Neto of the Los Angeles Angels when he was playing college at Campbell. I think I told you about this because I was really high on Neto from the start was he does this really cool thing where with zero strikes, one strike, he takes a war hack, leg kick, swinging for the fences, all that kind of stuff. And when you see that swing, you'd be like, oh, that's going to be a guy who swings and misses, strikes out a lot. He swings and misses 0-1, 0 whatever, with, you know, the strike, the count is. But as soon as two strikes comes in, shortens up, looks to put the ball in play a little more contact-oriented, and that's really interesting that Matt Olson said that because you don't normally hear that from guys with big power. But guys with big power almost can get away with it more because naturally he's just going to accidentally hit some home runs. Yeah, and I think it's something that has probably... There's probably been more ca- catalyzation for, for hitters to make these changes this year with the shift rule and the fact that more balls being put in play have turned into base hits. So it makes sense to be like, all right, now let's just try put balls in play. Whereas when the shift was in play, especially a guy like Olsen always got crushed by the shift, these big powerful lefties where you know if you're going to hit a ground ball, it's almost always going to be an out. So I'm always going to try and hit a home run. I think that was one of the, whether it was accidental or on purpose, benefits of the shift rule that has really helped uh, baseball a lot. I think like the watchability, balls in play, but it's just – Seeing this guy in this team, a guy from the Atlanta area, locked up, locked up. They all a, are. I know that's the. It's ridiculous. But locked up to a huge contract. The second he gets traded, he gets uh, he gets traded to Atlanta. They let Freddie Freeman walk, a franchise icon. He's having the best season of his career, and no one's even talking about the way the Braves. Like, oh my God, the Braves let Freddie Freeman go because they replaced him with a guy who's probably become the second best first baseman in baseball with more power. Probably fits their profile a little bit better, and it's just it's ridiculous. You hear Michael Harris talk in the outfield, mic'd up on ESPN. And he's like so loose and cool and confident. Like he, this guy had like a 170 batting average for two months of the season. Most other teams, organizations in baseball, guys with 170 batting average for two months, people are people want him gone. Like even though he has such a good rookie season, now he just like was cool. He was relaxed. And he's like, oh, now he's great. And it's like you think about how quickly it happened with this guy. Harris talked about how much he loved watching Ronald Acuna when he was in high school. Yeah. Now he, now he plays with him. Like that's how quickly Michael Harris came to the majors and is producing for this Atlanta team coming from the Atlanta area. He says his favorite baseball player growing up as a kid was Jason Hayward. Jason Hayward still playing baseball. <laughs> and he said they're from the same area, like in Georgia. And it's like, it's, it's so the turnover is so ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Sean Murphy's from Kennesaw, which is like a baseball hotbed down in Georgia. Austin Riley is like Memphis, Tennessee, but I'll tell you right now, they're Braves fans out in Memphis. They don't have a professional baseball team anywhere close. They all root for the Braves. Like their ability to just have this homegrown talent. And I will say this, the Mets have been very good at developing homegrown talent hitters. We know this. We've had Nimmo, Alonzo, McNeil. I mean, even talking about guys that aren't on the team now, like Conforto, guys that came through the organization and have been successful. But the ability to keep them on the team, keep them at such a cheap price, that's what makes the Braves so effective in what they've done. Because as much as I love to call Ozzy Albies the most overrated player in baseball, he's so good. He's a very, very good baseball player. 
But the fact that they pay him, what, like $4 million a year and Ronald Acuna makes like 10 or whatever it is, like that's the value is out of control. I have a fun trivia question for you. Guess, two-part question. Guess the highest average annual uh, salary in the Braves and then guess who makes it. Guess oh, the number and guess the player. Okay, so highest average annual salary. I'm going to go with Marcelo Zuna. No, it's not Zuna. <laughs> that okay. He's actually fifth. Wow, fifth. Okay, so is it yeah. going to be? It'll probably be a a pitch. Is it Rizal Iglesias? No, he's fourth. Oh, okay. Who's the highest paid? It's Olson. Okay, all right. I, but, I was trying to think like outside the box more than that. More, him and him and Morton are basically the same though, separated by one million dollars. And then Acuna, Iglesias, Ozuna. That's the top. Yeah. That's the five highest paid players in the Atlanta Braves. Team with the best. And I think. Baseball. Also makes like twenty two million dollars a year. Like doesn't even really the highest yeah. paid player in the Atlanta Braves makes twenty one million dollars a year. It's it's unbelievable. So it's, it's the Jesse Pinkman meme over and over again. How can they keep getting away with this? And, <laughs> and it's um, not it's not like they find like these guys for like great no. value. It's not like you signed a Tommy Pham in the off season for like no. three four million dollars. These were established great players awesome. that for some reason are free. I mean, Olsen, the Olsen thing, he's not really freeze because the first baseman contracts in baseball are just suppressed. Like, we, we've kind of yeah. seen that around the league, especially even Freddie Freeman. Freddie Freeman's going to be one of the greatest first basemen of all time. He's he's having an unbelievable season right now. He's hitting about 330, like 20 homers. He makes, I don't even think he makes 30 million. He might make about 30 million, but it's a very short contract. This Olsen deal is long. And he's making 20 million per. He already came in as one of the best first basemen in baseball. But the fact that Acuna is going to be one of the most valuable players of our lifetime, he's making 15, 17, 20 million dollars a year. It's ridiculous. Austin Riley, Mark key third baseman signed the contract when he was already an all-star he's making 15 going up to 25 million dollars a year albies makes no money ozzy albies makes pennies dollar ozzy albies makes hockey nhl money shout out john not here for this episode it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable what's going on but then you kind of listen to these guys talk and you see the way they play you see the way they interact with each other and you see the way their coaches interact with them and it reminds me of a quote that kyle body had on twitter or on a podcast i forgot where i heard it but it was kind of recently where a lot of these teams who like kind of start these new regimes, and I think the Orioles are a pretty good example of this, where it's like no matter what answers you have, no matter what algorithm you have, no matter what training methods you have, developmental methods you have, the most important thing in place for these ball clubs is always culture. And you saw you see that with the Astros, how lockstep those guys are. You've seen it with the Orioles coming up now in the last like basically full calendar year since this whole Orioles thing has clicked, where you can just see the desire, you see the fire, and you see that with this Braves team where it's just yep. these guys are killers. They are they they don't care about anything, anything except winning these baseball games, and they love doing it against the Mets. They were up like 15 runs on Saturday afternoon, and Ron Washington's going doing these crazy defensive shifts, like clapping in guys' faces, like yelling at them, and they're like chomping at the bit to score the 20th run against the Mets in a game that we all just wanted to end more than anything in the world. Yeah, the Braves are dogs. I mean, again, I hate this team with all my guts in the world. Hate I'll hate I hate the organization. I hate everything about Atlanta. I hate the colors. Yeah, everything. They suck. I hate them so much, but damn, I respect the hell out of them. I mean, just like you said, the ability to simply all be under the same thought process. Like, I want to win. We're going to win. We're, we're not just going to win, too. We're going to crush you. We want to embarrass you. We want it to hurt the way that we beat you. And unfortunately, we did see that again, like we said, in game one of the doubleheader. That one hurt a little bit. That one, that one stung a little more than the other losses. But that's something that I think not only like the Mets, but all teams in baseball should strive for is like not only just be the best, be the best and make sure everybody knows you're the best. You want to be obnoxiously the best. And honestly, I think that's the best way I can describe the Braves obnoxiously good. And that comes from the Astros school of thought, I feel like, where they are just they're coming out there to ball. Like they yeah. like the Dodgers, I feel like everyone kind of talks about the Dodgers, the marquee organization. And they definitely all have all the systems and the practices in place. Like how Bali said, like the algorithms, the, all the strategies, the methods, but they miss that organization. They kind of lack that dog a little bit. And we've kind of seen that time and time again, where they get, and again, like we also, we're talking about this Braves team. Like they really, again, I'm knocking on all the wood in the world here. They really haven't been the most successful postseason team in a while. They won that world series. They're probably going to win this one. I'm just saying that because you guys know <laughs> I like to say things. I talked about how great the weather was in August with a bad weekend it's for weather. Rained like crazy. <laughs> Rain and humidity really, really killed the whole weekend. It's my bad on that one guys. But it's like, you just see this like tenacity in them. And again, they're not, they, they had an incredibly disappointing playoff loss to the Phillies last yes. year after they won their World Series against the Mets in the end of the regular season, and they acted like it too. But they do – these guys relish in beating the Mets. Ozzie Albies had a quote, which you you shared with me. You should pull up again to talk about right now. And then Matt also yeah, has some it. comments on um, 
I don't know, pardon my take last week, but it's like these guys really want to beat the Mets. Yeah, so Ozzy Albies said yesterday, I'm trying to find the quote, where'd it go? Hello, where is this quote at? Sorry, guys, this is great podcasting. Okay, here he goes. This is from uh, Justin Toscano, who I believe used to be a, an old Mets beat writer as well. Ozzy awesome. Albies on how much pleasure the Braves take in beating the Mets. A lot of pleasure, of course, because they always say they're going to beat us. That's all I can say. I won't say much. Which, I mean, you can read between the lines. You know what he's saying. He's like, they say they're going to beat us. Whether he's talking about the players, the fans, whatever it is. I think it's just the idea that like the Mets think that they're going to be us and they just haven't done it yet. And they love to make sure that we aren't. And that, to me, like uh, we have no idea what's going on inside the Mets like clubhouse or whatever. That's like that's poster board material. That's bulletin board material. Like put that up there. And it's like this. This is the guy we want to bury now because like he's not only he's taking his shots respectfully. And I think it's like good. I like I, I want there to be a little bit of a rivalry because right now there kind of isn't. But uh, it's like, man, play with a chip on your shoulder like that. I, I can just respect it. You really do respect it. And ESPN flashed the graphic. And again, we're just like sticking the knife and really twisting it now with all of us. But we're living this. And you guys listen to this podcast. You, you probably do like this a little bit, too, because we're going to talk about this. Since the Mets were 10 games up in the division last year on June 1st, which is a comment I'm going to get back to in a little bit, the Braves <laughs> are over 33 games ahead of them. Which is and insane. They're, it's they're like one. They're like one. I think it was one fifty two and seventy four since that time. Which is like I, you look at that. And it doesn't. Even, and the Mets are. I think even after the, still with the amazing second half they had last year. I think they're one nineteen and one oh nine since then. Which is like, like it's it, it, it it's crazy. It's 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 really crazy for a team to put together this kind of stretch of baseball. This like full 14, 15 months where they only have one player making more than $20 million in the entire roster. And it's littered with all-stars proven all-stars proven commodity all-stars. It's, I mean, shout out your boy, Alex Anthopoulos with his Greek voodoo magic, yeah. but, like to put this together. But I, I want to use that date because there was comments that Matt Olson made on the, on the biggest sports podcast on earth. Pardon my take this week where they were asking him a lot about Mets stuff. And he basically said, like, they, they started the conversation with the, uh, the the guy that we don't like, that we don't really support at all. Yeah. Kind of, he's crazy, and he screams, and he's overweight. You know you who it know, is. You guys know who he is. And basically, they pro, they pro, they prefaced, like, do you guys watch his videos? Ha ha. They were like, yeah, like, a lot of times we beat them. We, like, some guys like to watch the videos and be funny about it. But it's like, we understand that's, like, a character. The thing that really got to us, he said, and I'm, I'm you know, you guys could, back, could go back and listen to the interview. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but... And he didn't even know the guy's name. And I'm not going to use the guy's name either because I don't want to embolden <laughs> him. But Mark and I were tweeting about him a lot this weekend. He uh, he had some comments that we, especially as 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 people we with the Mets here, will not uh, dignify in any way about no. a player in the team. He said that when that bald guy on TV, who you guys know I'm talking about now, said the division was over last year on June 1st, that really got to us. And we were like, okay, they think it's over. It's not over. Yeah. And to hear... The best, right? Basically, the best player, I guess, second best player on your main rival say that the team, the locker room was galvanized and motivated by something that an imbecile said on television <laughs> is so enraging because it's like, damn, like finding that motivation there from something yeah. that the, the mess players didn't even do. And he also made comments, and we guys remember this is last year, William Contreras was playing uh, Narcos as his walk up song. He said, Yeah, the Mets really love those little trumpets, Red Diaz, like really taking a shot at the like the fanfare around the trumpets and it's like these guys wake up and go to bed hating us why hate hurt us they do they hate the mets and they want to beat the mets and they really have a complex now after the way last season ended and the way the season is gone and it's it's really frustrating but right now this is just where we're at and it sucks yeah it sucks big time and i really wish that bald-headed guy never said anything i really wish i mean like the day he did it we me and you both were like what are we doing what are we doing? It's June. Like we've, we've known what the Mets have done in September back in 10 years ago or so, or I guess 12, 13 years ago now. But like, yeah, like well, you said, June, thing. it was June 1st. And a little also yeah. behind the scenes for you guys, that was just before we began doing this podcast officially with the Mets. And we had a field day with those comments. We said a yes. lot of things about those comments and you guys probably go back and listen to that. You could probably infer what we were talking about, but it, it to hear a player on another team over a year later, remember yeah. that moment, that basically changed the direction, I want to say, kind of this franchise in the last 18 months of Major League Baseball. It hurts. really hurts. hurts. Something outside of the team, outside of the control, made such an impact. But it also, I think, like, again, I hate the Braves, but this is this is something to like, keep in mind when you're looking at the team and everybody moving forward. Is like, these are things that hopefully, like, we can someday say that we're doing as well. Like, that 
the Mets are playing this 18, 24 month stretch of a hundred plus win baseball that they're smoking their rivals. They're crushing it. They're just beating the living hell out of teams and just destroying them. And there was a, there was a point last year where it was like that things at the beginning of the year started off fantastic up to June 1st. I mean, even through June 1st for a while, things were incredible. Yeah. We took the team played. I said, we took four or five from the Braves this exact weekend, this exact same time last year. And it really felt like, yeah, we got them. And then we went down there. We had tough fought series and went down there a second time. And it was like, Oh man, but so I don't know this Mets team. Like, you could feel it all weekend. Like there's anger, there's frustration, there's is it's it's upsetting, and you could just you could feel it. And something happened last September. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I, it just it's just it's just been like that ever since. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely not no fun. I'm I'm sure nobody's having fun on on the Mets side. There's no way about that. Frustration, anger, disappointment. I think all the the terms that you'd get from your parents when like you got an F on a test or, you know, got caught doing something, whatever it was, it was all those, those buzzwords that they throw at you. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. I'm sure. That's how everybody feels right now. And you know, light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully coming soon, but that was a tough, tough series to watch. At least though, we did get to see Kodai Senga on Sunday, very much a bright spot in this team. Also great to hear Francisco Lindor is, is back and healthy because it started the series yeah, off scary. with him having some some right side soreness, I believe is what they said. Uh, ended up being okay, which is huge, huge plus. Love seeing Francisco Lindor play baseball every single day. But speaking of Kodai, bright, spiny, bright shining spot after a rough first inning, really settled in nice. Yeah, this has been a couple times now this season where we've seen Kodai Sanga fight through some early troubles. And that first inning... It's just a, the big thing is that the top of the Braves order is so ridiculously good. And when Ron Acuna gets on to lead off an inning and you're just staring at Matt Olson, obviously Albies and Austin Riley, it's like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I got to really try yeah. it. You could, could feel that. I think Kodai was like kind of squeezing the ball tight with Acuna on base specifically. And it's just, you, you, that's pressure. That's what great base dealers do. And you have to give credit to Acuna and the Braves for that. But it, it, it was so easy after that. I think at one point he retired 11 in a row going through the second, third, fourth, and fifth innings. Like he wound up, cruising to six innings, seven strikeouts, only those three earned runs on on the uh, the Marcelo Zuna basis clearing double in the first, where again, like we, we give a lot of credit to culture, but still insane that that guy's playing baseball for this team and the way he's playing it. But the way that Kodai Sang is pitching right now, I'm trying to pull up the league leaders in ERA right now because his hasn't updated for the league, but I want to see where he's at comparatively. He's 330 right now. so He's 330, but in the National League, that he's only behind Blake Snell, Justin Steele, Merrill Kelly is still hanging out up there, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then Zach Allen. And then Zach Allen. Yeah. So yeah. fifth fifth in National League and run average. It's just an incredible rookie season for Kodai. He also he kind of made an adjustment after that first inning tonight, which I really like to see. In total, he had oh, I lost my tab. In total, he had 16 swings and misses, which is just exactly where he loves That's to live lot. all the time. And that first inning, he was kind of pitching back in a way where he started out the season pitching where it was fastballs, ghost forks, fastballs, ghost forks. And then he just started dropping a lot of curveballs in starting in the second inning. And the first one he threw, if I remember correctly, was to start the at-bat against Ronald Acuna his second time up. First pitch, curveball right there, got a called strike on him. Up 0-1, Acuna, and he just, he just, and the second pitch was goes fork, suddenly it was 0-2. Ended that bat very quickly, very easily. And Kodai was throwing a bit of a flatter curveball that was coming in a little bit harder today, that he was getting more called strikes with. He only threw it five times, he got three called strikes with it, and there was one foul ball. Pretty good. And I think that we've seen Kodai really make these quick adjustments on the fly. We saw also a lot of colors tonight. Only one less color than fastball. It's really become his primary pitch, which is really cool to see. And he's throwing that pitch harder right now with a tiny bit less movement. But flattening this curveball a little bit, I think kind of looking for it to be more of like a get me over pitch. Or maybe that's just an adjustment he made in game. You know, maybe he has his loopy curveball. Maybe he was like, now I'm going to throw my flat curveball, try and get it in. Really cool to watch him adjust on the fly. Really cool to see him mix that up. Another thing that Kodai did in this game that was nice, his slider, pitch that. Has been a little hot and cold development. It's kind of been moving a little bit better than his sweeper recently. The sweeper is something that he was trying a lot at the beginning of the year and didn't work very well. He has six swings and misses with it. That's the most he's gotten in the start in his career so far. And the first yeah. time he, the first time he's even gotten five since uh, May 30th. And the other, otherwise, besides one start with five whiffs tonight, Sunday night with six whiffs, he's never gotten more than two in any start as a Met. So yeah, it's really I mean, interesting to see him work on that weapon. I think it's, it could be something he's going to use going forward. Besides the just sheer ability that Kodai Senga has, I think we we now know very much has the chops to cut it as a pitcher in the ma- in the majors right now. Based on what we've seen, he's looked great. But he's very cerebral. He's always thinking. Like you said, that ability to make the adjustments on the fly is something that you hear from. Granted, Kodai like is a veteran of pitching professionally, obviously because he had the career in Japan. 
but making that adjustment while also being in major league baseball learning you know how the game's played over here comparatively to how it was in japan that's something that you hear like some of the great pitchers in the game talk about like okay i realized this pitch isn't working for me today so i scrapped it i went to another one like that growth that we've seen from kodai alone is just so encouraging for his career and just the, how quickly he's getting better and how easily he's able to stack these adjustments one on top of the other and like keep things moving forward. It's, it's been such a pleasure to watch him. I really, really enjoy Kodai. He's been a massive bright spot for this team the entire year and major win for the front office, just having this guy locked up. Really love watching him. But it was kind of the extent of the excitement in this series. The offense did click a little bit. We had a nice, uh, nice big inning, six-run inning in, uh, in on Sunday Night Baseball. Nice to hear David Cohen talk about it too. He, David Cohen's a great analyst. It's really good to hear him talk about teams without the shackles of Michael Kay and being able to <laughs> yeah. speak, speak freely. But it, yeah, this you got serious with tough one, guys. It was a really tough one. Yeah, got to give a shout out to Jeff McNeil too. He's been hot recently since August 5th. He's hitting like 340 or 350 with another three for five tonight. Someone who, I mean, I know the season's getting a little late now and got to be realistic here. It's, it's not looking great, but... Good to see him swinging the bat better as we get you know later on in the season because he has had a bit of a disappointing season based on where we know Jeff can be uh, and what kind of player he is. So happy to see him swinging the bat well again, three for five. Uh, I'm not going to say that he's doing anything in particular right now because I just I'm I'm not doing that to Jeff. He's our boy, but he's playing really good baseball. Take a look at his stats. So take a look at the game logs. That's all I'll say. Also, for sure, shout out Jose Quintana who. I say it every single episode, but I, I just the him having him being like the steadying force in the back of the rotation. You really, really think about where this team could have been if that was happening in April and May. It really stinks. Yep. But giving up a one earned in six innings on Saturday night, second game of Saturday's double header, ERA is three hundred three in the season. It's a really good spot to be for a veteran, and he has pitched very well, very much up to the contract we've given him, and he's been he's been a really good guy to have around. Yep. No, it's been a it's been a pleasure to watch him pitch as well. So. Tim LaCastro back, came back from injury, got to see Timmy Lowe back in the game. So he was playing a little bit. Um, Rafael Ortega was three for four in this game. Just like some good con contributions from everybody on the field around the team. Seeing Brandon Nimmo play a little left field too, which is interesting. So keep an eye out for that as the season goes on. Otherwise, I think the last thing to talk about with this series is the estimate. To which James, ding, 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 right on the money. It was hit by pitches. And James had said four. There was four in this series. So James is the victor in this one. John, of course, is not with us tonight, so I'm going to be reading out the estimate for you guys. We're going to keep it nice and simple, keep it easy. Mets going up against the Pirates. We'll give you the pitching matchups and everything you need to know in a second. Total runs. Total runs between the two teams in the three-game series. Maybe now is a good chance for you to say who's pitching for us. Yep. Uh, we have Monday evening, 7-10, Carlos Carrasco versus Pirates prospect Quinn Priester. Tuesday, okay. also 7-10, battle, uh, battle of lefties over here. David Peterson versus Bailey Falter. And then Wednesday afternoon, 1 o'clock, Tyler McGill versus Johan Oviedo. Okay, so total runs scored. I'm going to go with... There could be some runs in the series. Yeah, I'm, I'm going... I got a number. I got my number. I, I, didn't, I wrote it down. I'm not going to show it. It's on a very dirty piece of paper. There's a lot of scribbles on here. I've just been doodling while watching the Mets game. It's the kind of energy I've got today. Is I'm a real doodler. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I, I got my number. I made, a, I made my first Sunday sauce of the season. Usually you wait till the fall, Ooh. but you know, got, got some nice meatballs going. It was it was a nice day for sauce. So, what do you do for the meatballs if you can't put in like the bread or the breadcrumbs or anything like that? I use, I use gluten-free breadcrumb. It holds well. Oh, okay. Usually I just maybe will put like instead of one egg, I'll put two. Maybe mm -hmm. if it's still a little dry, I'll do a third egg in there if I'm really feeling crazy with a pound of beef. But wait, what are you, uh, money bags over there <laughs> using three eggs for your meatballs? I, the the grocery store I get my eggs at because I mean I feel like if any of you guys are, live in New York, you probably understand the plight of like having like four different grocery stores, like knowing which which grocery store you get each thing. I don't think they know about the egg thing. I get I get really? a dozen eggs for three seventy nine. They I don't think they have any idea what's going on. <laughs> they got no clue. I don't even know. Is it still a problem the egg prices? I think it's relatively a problem, but not 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 for me. Not not the orange tree because the orange tree hooks it up. <laughs> guys, it's, right. open it's, it's a twenty four hour grocery store. It's unbelievable. That's huge for the lifestyle we live. I know. Like there, there have been a couple of times where I've like popped in there, like you know, three o'clock in the morning, get get, get a pint of Ben and Jerry's, like just you know, <laughs> just cause, just cause you're feeling it, just because you're having a good time. All right, I got my number. You got yours? I do. All right, three, two, one, twenty six. Twenty nine. Whoa. Okay. So Interesting. Always. So just James, I got twenty nine. Mark is twenty six. Yes, and James won the last one, so the series is now tied. I don't know what the score is, but all you need to know is it's uh, it's even. It's even. Yeah, we're, 
Estim as a game of streaks. Like I, I think I'm on four in a row right now after after not winning one for about two weeks. So that, that's how it is. I, that's how the game. I'd is. love to know the last time like we've actually gone back and forth without just like rap because like you go up big, then I tie it, then we then we kind of yeah. keep it close, and then like someone ends up winning. It's kind of what happened with the second half one as well. Also, you have a date for when you're going to be wearing the jersey, hopefully, right? I have proposed date. I think I'm uh, the goal is going to be again. We, I still want to talk to John because I do think it'd be kind of funny to do it on a Friday night. But I also think it'd be funny the podcast in it. So I think I think it's going to be the Peacock game Sunday, August 27th against the uh, Angels. Okay, I think that'll, yes. that'll be a fun time. The only the only thing I don't <laughs> the only thing that's a little bit scaring me about the estimate punishment for the first half is like I don't want to make it like I'm like I'm showing anybody up because yeah, like we, we know the second half hasn't gone that well. I don't really want to make a big spectacle about myself wearing cleats and baseball pants at a baseball game. Like I want to just kind of relax in the upper deck. I don't want to go in the field. I don't want to go. No, we're not going on the field. No, 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 no. no. I, I don't, I do not want, I want to be very respectful to everyone in the organization. I don't want to offend anybody here. Like when you're wearing a tuxedo, that's like, it was stupid, but it was classy and it was opening yes. day and everyone, including John, John was wearing his Johnny threats, his silk satin that day. Uh, what's our, what's our word for John this episode? Uh, how about, um, nutmeg? Nutmeg, yeah, sure. John John's a footy. He likes footy. Yeah, nutmeg. So probably keeping up Prem- with the MLS. I think that the Premier the League kicks uh, off next week. No, sorry, this weekend. Sorry, oh, this started? weekend. Yeah, huh. yeah. Erling, Ch- Erling Holland is picked up right where he left off. He scored two goals against Fulham. Big for wow. my Premier League fantasy team. <laughs> yeah, sh- shout out England. Well, really like England. Yeah, you're a big fan of England recently. I love, I love England. It's great. I hate but it, you but also, I also love but you it. also hate it a little bit. Yeah. I hate it a little bit, but I also really like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah two, two, two. It's an interesting dichotomy right now for England. But uh let's preview this pirate series, guys. Uh Pittsburgh Pirates have had a very bad couple of months of baseball. They yes. were the darling of April and May, and they've completely fallen by the wayside. Their offense has dried up. Their pitching has really taken not even just a step back, three or four or five steps back. It is <laughs> Not been a fun summer for the Pittsburgh Pirates. They have shown some progress this year, and I think they are a team that is probably closer to competition than I think a lot of people thought. And they also lost their best player, like the second week of the season in O'Neill Cruz, yeah. who was looking like he was going to put together what was going to be some kind of uh, some kind. Of, oh, it's also funny. I'm saying all these words. The Mets and the Pirates have the exact same record. Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay. Sick. But it looked like O'Neill Cruz was going to be putting together what could have been like the big breakout season for him, putting all those tools together into being like a real marquee player, but hasn't happened so much. And now they're just kind of having the Pittsburgh Pirates season that everyone sort of kind of expects. And, you know, that's okay. That's the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's who they are. That's not no big deal. But there are still a lot of exciting players in the team. And I think there's a lot of cool things to watch. Coming to the series, yeah. Brian Reynolds has been scorching hot. He's a of course. really good baseball player. He's just he's just a consummate pro. He goes out there, he plays the outfield, switch hitter, hits for power, hits for average. Like He's one of like the more underrated marquee good players in baseball that I don't think a lot of people know as much about as they probably should. Yep. And he signed that big contract with the pirates as well. So he's going to be there for quite some time. A guy who wants to be in Pittsburgh, kind of cool for a young player who's in his prime, who had free agency years coming up being like, no, I want to be here. I want to be a part of this. Cause like we said, they definitely have some good stuff coming up the line. Got to talk about the prospects that they got up as well. Henry Davis, not swinging the bat as well as he was when he first came up, but the former number one overall pick catcher out of Louisville. They said, you're not catching anymore. You're playing the outfield. We want you out there. So uh, he's not playing great, but he he crushes baseballs when he gets a hold of them. And then, of course, got to talk about Andy Rodriguez, my boy, Andy. I've been all over Andy for a while. Yeah. Former Mets prospect. Yeah. Unfortunately, don't have him anymore. He was one. part of the uh, Joey Lucchese trade, I believe, where we got Joey Lucchese in that three-team trade. But Andy has been hot recently, I believe, playing better of late. But he's also kind of in that same boat of like, remember when Alvarez first got called called up? Catching at the pro level for a guy who also was getting thrown around to three other different positions in the minors and being a rookie while also still trying to hit and playing for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, so he has some ups yeah. and downs, but he's a special player. And he, uh, he actually even has appeared at first base in one game this year. But Andy is a prospect I'm also I'm very high on. He's just an exciting, like explosive, like twitchy young player. He's like smaller, but you can really see the way like his very strong wrists, which is kind of a cool thing yes. to see the young hitter. You can really turn on a ball. But Andy, I think kind of, Got a very rude awakening to the major leagues. He struck out in six of his first seven at bats over two games the first weekend he came up. Since that time, though, he's hitting 250, 323, 482. So basically an 800 OPS since, since his yep. first two games of his career 115 WRC plus and 10% walk rate, 27% strikeout rate, two home runs. I think he is someone who has some very serious potential. He kind of had a disappointing year in AAA this year, especially relative to where he was the year before. Because in 2022 in AA, at 22 years old, 
He was 100% better than the league average, 200 WRC plus. He was walking basically as much as he was striking out with a 354 for the 680 triple slash in double A, 22 year old. And then this year, triple A, just he didn't really have it, but I think it was morally a lot. I think a lot of focus was given to him on defensive stuff because I think coming up as a catcher with a young pitching staff, I think they know, especially with the Henry Davis thing, which I always I thought would be kind of cool for both of them to move around because Andy has played some outfield and some second base in the minor leagues. Yeah. He kind of has more of a utility player frame than a catcher, I'd say. Like he's like, six foot six one maybe like 180 pounds maybe probably listed below that i kind of love the fact that they could have had like this crazy catching tandem but they're putting davis in the outfield which do what you do that's their organization but he and he's very exciting i also do want to shout out a former met who uh the first month of the season he, had, he was getting a lot of a lot of stuff on twitter because he was looking really really good he uh colin holderman had one two three four five six seven eight nine ten he had a ten game scoreless streak going on through the end of may and early june his pitches were up in miles an hour they was all over pitching ninja but since then since june 3rd he has a five era with a five fip so i think he is probably still the guy everyone thought he was strikeouts have gone down the walks have gone up that amazing velocity that was kind of that's kind of supporting him up for a while has gone away mostly he missed a couple weeks with injury. We know he's had some injury problems in the past. So I think that's another you know like the LOL Mets thing but you won't hear because for the past two months Kyle Holterman's been a been a five ERA guy. Yeah, and of course, shout out your boy Dave Bednar. Are we gonna are we gonna get to meet Dave this weekend? Are we gonna we gonna or this week? I'm intending to. I'm gonna, What's wrong? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot I'm gonna shoot my buddy Ross a text tomorrow. I'll be like, hey, tell Dave uh, tell Dave to look out for me on the field. I would really like to say hi and get that picture. Dave Dave Bednar is just he's a hell of a guy. He's just it, like he like a lot of times you meet some of these athletes. Not I feel like every guy we've met, especially every guy in the Mets, has been incredibly kind, been gracious, awesome. grateful to us. But yeah, some players in other sports, and like I met players in other teams before. Like one guy I met, Jordan Hicks. Not the nicest guy. Yeah, you could just say I didn't, it. I didn't like yeah. Jordan Hicks. Yeah, he, he wasn't that much fun. Uh, but Dave Bednar is just like exactly what he is. Like he's born and bred Pittsburgh. He loves, he loves Pittsburgh, loves Pennsylvania, loves the Midwest, he just drinks light beer. He has a really nice fiance. I spent I, I took around New York one night when they were in town a few years ago. Like he's just he's just a hell of a guy. Really good guy, nice family, like just all good people. Love the Bednars, and I ho- hope to say hi to Dave this week. Yeah, I mean, it should be an interesting series. Definitely uh, keep an eye out for it. I'll be at the stadium on Monday, for sure, going with my parents and going to go hang out. So if any of you guys are there, we've been seeing a lot of you guys recently at the ballpark. So yeah. remember to say what's up to us. We have some stickers to give to you guys if you ever see us. And then, of course, we'll be there on Wednesday to record the episode. So otherwise, I don't really got anything else, James. You got anything else you want to talk about here? Or is it time to uh, wrap this one up? I'll go in this. Just keep an eye on Quinn Priester's curveball. His curveball's nuts. It's a really good okay. pitch. Just bringing him to the majors. The rest of the pitch is not that exciting, but that curveball is nice. There you go. Keep an eye out for Quinn Priester's curveball. Of course, always. James always got a little something for us to keep an eye out for. But uh, guys, as always, thank you so much for listening and watching. Make sure you follow us on all our social media at Mets Up, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the New York Mets YouTube channel for the video version of our podcast. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, whatever it is, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. Again, we really do appreciate all you guys hanging around. I know the season's been a little tough, but any of you that are still listening and watching and supporting, we really do appreciate it. It's uh, it's awesome that we're all we're all sick in the head together. So we appreciate that. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Best Up Podcast. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.